welcome to part two of the official objective subjective galaxy quest review in part one quick summary we learned that galaxy quest itself is an old cheesy television series that jason nesmith and his fellow cast members were doing the convention circuit to try and make a living however aliens from the planet thermia believed that galaxy quest was in fact real and recruited who they thought was commander taggart the actor jason nesmith to help them in their struggle against saris jason helped them a little bit thinking that it was just an act and then he learned it was real just as they sent him home so he quickly runs to his friends to tell them that it's all real they go to the ship and make the same discovery themselves leading us to <laughs> Know us? No, no. I don't believe there is a man, woman, or child on my planet who does not. So, as much as the crew of the Protector from the Galaxy Quest TV show is shocked to find out that there actually are aliens with spaceships and all that, they're also beginning to realize that these self same aliens believe that the adventures of Galaxy Quest is actual history. A year since we first received transmission of your historical documents, we have studied every facet of your missions and strategies. You've been watching the show? Lieutenant, historical documents. H historical documents from out here? So the Thermians try to explain how the crew of the Protector has become legend in their society. And while Jason is eating up what they're talking about, Gwen begins to realize the insane repercussions of them actually believing that any of this is true. In fact, all you see around you has been taken from the lessons gone and from the historical documents. Is this a, a spaceship? No, this is a starport for the ship. Jason is of course still ridiculously excited about the fact that he's about to show his friends something that they never even thought possible. And he doesn't really stop to think about the repercussions. This is, of course, consistent with his character from the beginning. He's borderline narcissistic, of course, and doesn't stop to consider all the facts. He doesn't stop to think about the fact that in leading on the Thermians into believing that they are, in fact, the crew of the Protector, they could be setting it up for a catastrophic failure oh my god it's real imagine for just a moment that you are a lifelong trekkie or you're one of the actors from star trek and you're face down with the Enterprise, the real Enterprise. How do you react? Are you completely blown away and shocked? Like Dr. Alex? Are you just so thrilled and caught up in it that you just wanna take part? Like Taggart? Are you concerned about the repercussions of what the show may have done to other cultures? Like Gwen? Or are you just so shocked that you can't think of anything like guy well it's hard to say but for each of us there's some kind of base level reaction that we would indeed have and i just love the fact that in this elevator scene we really get a taste for a genuine human reaction to being faced with something that is completely impossible and yet staring them right in the face and once again alan rickman absolutely steals the show his my god it's real is so perfectly delivered it feels so genuine as if this was in fact leonard nimoy staring at an actual uss enterprise in a hangar bay across from him beautiful shot and I have to say, that is why this is my absolute favorite shot 
in the entire film. We have to get out of here. Come on, guys. Jason, we're actors, not astronauts. You guys want to go home? Say the word, we'll go home. Pay our bills, feed our fish, fall asleep in front of the TV, and miss out on all of this. So as we transition to the hallway scene here, it's very apparent that Jason loves the idea of being Commander Taggart, while the rest of them just view this as something they did for a few years and how they make their living. And I really do like the character dynamics here, especially when you start thinking about where each of these people is, are coming from, because Jason was the leader on the show. He was the star of the show. And so he was used to being treated with a certain level of respect and decorum that the others were not given. And so for him, this couldn't be anything but completely and utterly awesome. However, for the rest of them, it was just a job. It really wasn't anything all that special. And to them, what they're doing is potentially dangerous for the Thermians, not to mention risky for themselves. They are, as Gwen said, they are actors, not astronauts. And to make matters even worse is the fact that the Thermians hold them in such high regard, especially Commander Taggart, that they virtually worship the man. It's like throwing gasoline on a flame. What? I was just about being on the show, man. So while Jason is as excited as a 10-year-old who was just handed the keys to the Magic Kingdom, well, Dr. Alex is at the exact opposite end of the spectrum. He is absolutely disgusted at the entire scenario. And in part, I can certainly understand why. After all, he had an entire career of living in the shadow of Jason. He always considered Jason to be a second-rate actor. And here he is now having to see an entire species of people who virtually worship the man that Dr. Alex has come to despise. And you can only imagine the raw contempt that he has given this situation. It is, in fact, a very natural human reaction to feel this way. And I, and while obviously I would disagree that it is the proper thing to do, it is certainly something that is very, very understandable. Well, as we move along, the crew of the Protector 2 then bring Jason and his crew up to the command deck so that they can then launch the Protector 2 to go and meet Saris. No pressure, huh? I'm glad I ain't the commander. <laughs> Laredo, take us out. Excuse me? <laughs> they designed those controls after watching you. So in a further demonstration of how much Jason is into this whole situation is he is now addressing his fellow actors by their characters' names, not by their actual names. So instead of referring to Tommy as Tommy, he calls him Laredo, the character that he played on the show. And this is actually a really interesting idea, is that since the Thermians studied Laredo's every move while piloting the ship, you would think that Tommy could naturally pilot the ship since he made up all of those movements and everything that he did. However, I would dare say that if I built an exact replica of the USS Enterprise, made the controls work pretty much the way that I see them work when we watch the show, and then I grab George Takei and put him at the helm, I kind of doubt he's going to know how to fly the ship because the problem is, is that he was just pretending. He was just playing around. He didn't really know what he was doing. And disaster could very well ensue as we see. Right. Okay. Right. Right. 
Take her out. Okay, honestly, this is probably Tommy's best moment in the movie because imagine for a moment, besides the insane amount of pressure of having to pilot this ship out of space dock, but just tapping that button to start up the engines. Like, you know that that button's going to fire up the engines, but you're used to sitting on an empty set where hitting the button does nothing, but they add effects later on. Here, he hits that button, the engines actually fire up, you hear them rumble, you probably feel the entire ship vibrate with power. What are you going to do? He has He's not expecting any of this. He's just completely out of his depth. And now he's got to try to fly the ship, and let's just say that it doesn't go perfectly smoothly. <laughs> Okay, so I got to I got to be honest here. This shot is in my humble opinion probably the worst single shot of the entire film. Not because of the story content, don't get me wrong, I've actually enjoyed this overall scene. I love what they're building on. I like the idea that Tommy is having such an incredibly difficult time piloting the protector too that he scrapes the walls. I think that's hilarious. What I don't like about this shot is that they just spent the last several minutes of this film trying to impress upon us how real this world is. That Dr. Uh, Dr. Alex and Jason and Gwen and Tommy and the rest are all just completely blown away by seeing what they always thought of as a cheesy TV show actualized in reality. Then we get this physics breaking shot right here. Why is it a physics breaking shot? Because a few moments ago, we saw the front of the hull of the ship scraping against the side wall of the star base. The problem is that if you look at the design of the ship, the turbo nacelles that stick out of the side of the ship stick way out of the side of the ship. Not just, you know, a couple of feet, but like probably hundreds of feet out. And there is no way that Tommy could have scraped the side of the inside at the front end of the ship, come out of the hangar bay with the ship pointing relatively straight forward, and not have those nacelles completely destroyed by being inside of the walls of the starbase. Instead, through some lazy compositing, as we see in this picture right here, the nacelles are completely untouched despite the fact that that is a physical impossibility. Now I know it's a nitpick here, and it's actually a nitpick that if this wasn't a comedy would be kind of almost a deal breaker for me. The fact that this is a comedy, I can, I can kind of let it go, but I can't not call it out because they really did try so hard in the last few minutes of this film to make this feel so real. And then this is just sloppy. So I'm, I'm truly disappointed by this shot. No, no, nothing against the story, nothing about against the characters, but the visual effects of this scene really left something to be desired. I'm the food synthesizer for each of you based on the regional menu of your birthplace. Okay, where you did it, tastes great. Are you enjoying your cat mop blood ticks, Dr. Lazarus? Just like mother used to make. And once again, Alan Rickman absolutely steals the show with his incredibly dry and just ridiculously frustrated delivery of every single line. He hates everything about what's going on. And the only reason he is even entertaining any of this is because he is a true professional to the core. And so he is trying to say how much he appreciates his tics when, of course, it is utterly vile to him while all of his friends are eating their absolute favorite meals. Now, 
unfortunately, the comedy kind of takes a little bit of a downturn here because the we have to set the stakes for the film. Now, this is a necessity for the film, but the way they do it just doesn't sound quite right. They basically find out that the reason that Ceres is after the Thermians is because he knows about the Omega-13, and the discussion comes up of what exactly does the Omega-13 do? Well, <sighs> we'll just let this line speak for itself. It has at its heart a reactor capable of unthinkable energy. If we were mistaken in our construction, the device would act as a molecular explosive, causing a chain reaction that would obliterate all matter in the universe. Now look, I understand that you gotta set up stakes. There's gotta be something at stake for things to be interesting and to feel the tension and the drama of any film. I also understand that Saris is evil. However, it makes zero sense to have a bomb that could destroy the entire universe. Why would anyone want such a weapon? Because to fire such a weapon would destroy the entire universe, including yourself and everybody that you know. And even if Saris was completely Batwoman crazy and was willing to destroy the universe in his mad obsession, would not his crew revolt against him because they just might want to survive? So I kind of have a problem with them trying to make the stakes so high when, in all honesty, simply having the Thermians and Ceres at war, Ceres is winning, and you bring in the crew of the Galaxy Quest TV show was plenty of stakes for this film, and they could have simply left the Omega-13 as a great unknown, and Ceres wants it because it's some kind of unknown tech that he might be able to improve himself with. But to make the tech that ridiculously powerful, to me, just doesn't work. Now, then Jason asks what is a surprisingly logical question at this point. Has Sarah's ever seen any of the historical records? No, thank God he has not. No. So how does he know about the Omega-13 device? Well, that is a logical question. And Malthazar's concerned look on his face is certainly appropriate given what the answer ultimately is. This is another problem with the Thermians as far as it being somewhat believable moving forward through this story. We have been given all these, this information about the Thermians being so ridiculously naive that they cannot even fathom the idea that a television series is anything other than historical record. We also, later in this film, find out that the Thermians genuinely don't understand the very concept of lying or deception of any kind or even just pretending to be something that you're not. They truly do not understand that. It makes zero sense to them whatsoever. And yet, we are supposed to believe that these self-same Thermians, well, do this? The tape was smuggled off of Saris's ship. Originally one of our own tried to lead. Is that all? After three days of this, you still require incentive. Now, don't get me wrong. My issue with this scene has nothing to do with the relative heroism of the former Thermian leader. My issue with the scene is all about the fact that they smuggled this information off of Saris's ship, which means that Thermians, these same idiotic, naive, 
bumbling fools that cannot figure out that a television show is a television show, that cannot figure out that Jason Nesmith is this guy's name, not Commander Taggart. These guys managed to sneak around on Saris's flagship, grab secure video, and get it off the ship so that they could then later view it. I'm sorry, I do not buy that for one freaking moment. It's simply not going to happen. Now, that being said, we then get a, <laughs> a reaction from our heroes. Guys, come on, hold on a minute. This can't leave. Give me some time to think. Think. Let's just think. Our valiant heroes, ladies and gentlemen. We gotta prepare the pods for my crew's departure. Begging your commander's pardon, sir, we can't launch pods at the moment. Saris will surely detonate any objects leaving the ship. Saris? Yes, sir, he's here now. Your presence is required on the command deck. Whoa. So at this point, our valiant heroes, <coughs> while trying to flee, discovered that they can't leave because Saris would simply kill them if they tried to take off. So they are left with little alternative but to actually face Saris. So they are taken to the command deck by Mathazar. I have raised Saris on Zeta frequency. Mathazar, my We help. meet again, Commander. Hello, Saris. How you doing? Uh, better than my lieutenant. Now try to keep in mind here that while yeah, Laredo looks like, whoa, what is going on here? This is not only the first time he's seen an alien of this particular species, but that alien just committed murder and is displaying the body of the person he murdered for them to see and enjoy. Give the device to me or I will destroy your ship. You know, um, We'd like to do that, but frankly, Sarah, sir, we don't know what it is or even where it is. You have 10 seconds. So it's pretty obvious that Saris means business and that the fine actors from the Galaxy Quest show are way out of their depth. There is nothing they can do that is going to resolve this situation. So they can't run and they can't really competently deal with anything. Now, this is where, of course, Jason decides to just become a method actor here. He's gonna go for broke and simply try to wing his way through this, make it work, and hope that his fellow actors, being the professionals they are, gonna go along with him. Gwen. Don't panic. Dealt with this guy before. He's as stupid as he is ugly. Hello. Come here. Jason. Not now, Gwen. No. Sit, 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 sit. sit. Listen, everything we can in, all right? Now, once again, we have a great example of how the writers truly were thinking ahead when they created the script for this film. By creating this whole situation where Jason is somewhat self-absorbed, that he doesn't really take into account what other people might be thinking and just assuming that everybody's gonna go along with everything that he wants to do. He basically is thinking that the rest of the crew is on board with him, that they all know what he's doing, that he is just, he's gonna be Captain Taggart now. And further, when he starts doing things like giving this gesture, thinking that, okay, I'm acting as Captain Taggart and therefore they're gonna know that I'm giving them the signal to kill it. Well, Gwen and the rest are not acting to them this is real life this isn't let's pretend to be a starship crew and so she is responding with the real world stage directions that that is the dead air signal and so while jason thinks that he has this clever plan unfortunately due to his own arrogance it kind of backfires on him these red buttons and send everything we have towards him, okay? Okay. All right, Gwen. Put me back on with it. Well, I'm trying to tell you, you are back. Perhaps I'm not as stupid as I am ugly. So the ultimate payoff for Jason's 
arrogance, for his assumptions, for his belief that everybody just must be on board with what he is doing is the possibility of the loss of his ship, the loss of his friends, the loss of the Thermians, and even the loss of his own life. And he gets that realization through the voice of Guy looking at the control panel. Moving toward the green thingy. I think, I think we're the green thingy. A little present for you, Commander. We gotta get out of here, move the ship, turn it, move it, go! So of course, Saris, learning from his mistake before, it simply starts firing on the protector too. Jason does what the only thing he can think of to do, which is to run away. And the problem is, is that there's really, they're outgunned, they're outclassed, and they don't even know what the heck they're doing. But along the way, something begins to change. And I love the way that they, this is subtle, but pay attention to right here while they're entering into their turbo speed. The enemy is matching velocity. Enemy is matching velocity! We're out of the fast time! Gosh, I'm doing it. I'm repeating the darn computer. So this is a interesting dichotomy here because they're about to hit rock bottom they are about to be the most in the most desperate position they will be in for this entire film however at this very moment is when they also as their personal journeys they begin to turn around gwen is now beginning to be the voice of the computer which was her role on the television show fred down in engineering is reporting to them what's going on down there and what's and what they need to do like he did on the show and dr alex well he's at his console giving advice as any good first officer would do like he did on the show everybody is beginning to take on their roles as they were in the show just as everything is about to fall apart won't take it the ship is breaking apart and all that just FYI. We've got to stop! Stop and we die. Tommy, just hold that thing down. Get up, hold that turbo down. It's a quick boost. Oh, like you know. So the delivery here is awesome. We're getting some great character moments all the way around. But unfortunately, we kind of sink down here for a minute because... <sighs> Again, and I know that some people disagree with me on this, but I think the Thermians are going to drag this whole thing down because, well, we'll just take a look. Wait, 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 wait. We, we, we might be able to lose him in, in this cloud here. Oh, I don't, I don't think that's a cloud. Mathis, what is it? This is the Tothian minefield left standing from the Great War of 12185. So why do I have a problem with this? Well, when Mathazar talks about the great war that this minefield was a part of, well, he's talking about Thermian history here. And if the Thermians are so naive and so ridiculously innocent as to not be able to pilot their own flagship effectively, they need to recruit others to be their military leaders for them because they are so inept. How could there have been a great war in the past? How is it that they had any kind of military complex before this at all but apparently they did and apparently there was a big minefield that was a part of it and this minefield is so effective that even their newest best ship is no match for the explosive force of all these mines but unfortunately it it sinks much much lower and it's not mathazar's fault oh god When Tommy freaked out before, I was okay with it. It made sense. But now it's just wearing thin. It's all he's doing now is screaming and freaking out and it's over the top. 
and I, I know it's a comedy, but he's the only one that is being so ridiculously over the top with his acting here. And it just kind of pulls me out of the whole thing because while obviously Gwen is upset and worried, obviously Dr. Alex is fearing for their lives. Guy is literally hiding under the table, but Tommy is just ridiculously panicked at this point. Now, I know some people say, well, that seems realistic. Maybe to you, it just doesn't work for me. And that's why this type of thing is subjective as far as I see it. And I talked to Mrs. Antitrekker about it to kind of get her opinion. She was with me on that is that it's just, they turn him into such a coward that it kind of, you lose your sympathy for the character at this point, which is really too bad. And they, and they push it even further. Oh, man! You all right? No, I'm all right. Don't touch it! Don't touch it! Take him to medical quarters. Thanks, Matheson. Oh! 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 So, yeah, they, they really just take it way too far. And, and looking at it, I kind of wonder, because at the beginning of this film, when we see the original Galaxy Quest TV show, Tommy is, of course, a little kid. And so he was a child actor on the show. And now, as Malthazar is carrying him off, literally kicking and screaming, it's like he's still that little kid, that he hasn't grown at all in 20 years. And so it... I, you know, you could say what you want about, maybe it's a commentary about the relative maturity of actors or something like that, but it just, uh, it's, it's just too much. And the reason that it bothers me so much is that that shot of Malthazar carrying Tommy off the bridge comes right after a great scene that perfectly depicts the crew hitting rock bottom right here. That shot is absolutely beautiful. Watching the protector drifting in space, hopelessly disabled. We just saw everybody in the crew thrown around the bridge. We know that all hope is lost and our heroes have to band together to come up with some kind of viable solution. They need to get their protector back up and running and figure out some way, some way to take on Saris. And it just doesn't seem possible. And aside from the antics of Tommy in that sequence with him screaming and crying and everything, I think they did a great job of showing the crew hitting rock bottom. But the other thing is, is that we saw that glimmer of hope as they were entering into their turbo speed with the characters beginning to take on the roles that they had on the show. And so as we move forward, we find that our heroes will only be able to save the day if they accept the roles that they've been paid to do on a TV show 20 years prior, starting with this computer briefing. Quadrants 32, 34, 40, well, what, uh, 43. What about the engines? Forward thruster shaft, 87% damage. Computer, what about the engines? Why don't we have power? The beryllium sphere has fractured. Now this highlights the absolute genius of the premise of this show which is that the Thermians built the protector to perfectly emulate everything they saw in what they believe to be historical records. And that means, of course, that since Gwen is the only person who actually talked to the computer on the TV show, and she would repeat whatever the computer said, they designed the ship with that in mind, which means the computer is only going to respond to Gwen and give her the answers for her to turn around and give to everybody else. Gwen is beginning to understand this and beginning to accept it. However, 
Not everybody is 100% on board with simply taking on their roles from the show because once again, Dr. Alex is going to get the short end of the stick. So he's going to be a little bit of a stick in the mud, no pun intended there. And I love this little scene because it perfectly encapsulates Gwen accepting the situation for what it is. Beryllium Sphere exists on board. No, we have no extra beryllium sphere on board. You know, that is really getting annoying. Look, I have one job on this lousy ship. It's stupid, but I'm going to do it, okay? I absolutely love Sigourney Weaver in that scene. She nails it. She's just given up on the craziness of the situation and accepting it and just wanting to figure out a way out of it. Now... Unfortunately, this show, as I've mentioned a couple times before, the Thermians, for me, kind of dragged the movie down a little bit compared to every other element. And this is no exception. The Thermians come in and apologize for letting down our brave heroes because, of course, they've seen the show and there's no way that the heroes could fail. They've never failed in all the historical documents. So how is it possible that they failed this time and so they determine it must be their own? So Gwen tries to explain to them that they're actors. In fact, we have begun to document our history from your example. No, not, not historical documents. They're not all historical documents. I mean, surely you don't think that Gilligan's Island is a... Those poor people. Now, don't get me wrong. I actually think that the Gilligan's Island gag is funny. The fact that Malthazar feels so bad for those poor castaways stranded on the island for so many years. And who knows if they've seen the movies that came out in the 80s where they find out that they get rescued but then end up stuck on the island again and stuff like that. So I get it, that's actually kind of funny. However, and this is where I have this problem, is that if that was the extent of the Thermians' misunderstanding, just that they thought that everything that was on television was real, I could kind of get past that. It's that they add on top of this, this level of stupidity that just doesn't quite jive with what they establish here. Because almost immediately after we get the Gilligan's Island gag, which like I said, I actually enjoyed, we get this. Is there no one on your planet who behaves in a way that's contrary to reality? You are speaking of Deception. Lies. Lies. We have only recently become aware of this concept. So right there, while Malthazar is selling it, and, and I, I, it, I can't fault the actors, but this is some bad writing. Because let's say, hypothetically, that the only two shows that the Thermians saw that they misinterpreted as historical documents were Galaxy Quest and Gilligan's Island, because they never mention another show by name, but we do know at the very least that they've seen Galaxy Quest and Gilligan's Island. And right here, Malthazar tells them that they've only recently, and he explains later because of Ceres, they've only recently come into the concept of lies and deception, that this was a completely foreign concept to them up to this point. Well, I gotta call complete and utter BS on that because I offer into the record for you a clip from Gilligan's Island. Now, this lie detector should prove conclusively that I had nothing to do with the notes. Uh, yes, exactly how does it work? Well, I've wired the ship's horn from the minnow and I've utilized the batteries from the radio. If anyone lies, the horn goes off. In this particular episode of Gilligan's Island, Mrs. Howell has a secret admirer and they're trying to figure out who it could be. So the professor constructs a lie detector and they start grilling everybody in the cast, well, the men in the cast, to see who might be Mrs. Howell's secret admirer. And... So they explain the concepts of lies and deceptions and even benevolent lies and deceptions in this case because it's a secret admirer and if you watch the episode, no spoilers or anything, but it turns out that the person who was the secret admirer was not doing anything bad. So they, they actually show the Thermians in this show exactly what a 
benevolent deception could be. And so for the Thermians to claim that A, they knew the historical records of the people of Gilligan's Island and B, have no idea what a lie or deception was until Ceres crosses their path is complete nonsense. Besides the fact that I'm sure that if we could see the entire historical records of all 82 episodes of Galaxy Quest, there are probably many episodes in which the bad guys or the crew of the Protector do various things to deceive each other as well. So I'm sorry, I cannot buy that. And this is where the writing really falls apart for me, because you should either have them just be naive and begin to be believe that this is history, or be completely stupid. But the problem is if they're completely stupid, there's no explanation for how they built all this wonderful technology and everything. So I say just make them the naive part and leave off the stupidity because it just doesn't work. Fortunately, as this conversation is going downhill really, really fast, well, Fred decides to interrupt them on the communications and show us the nonsense that is Star Trek techno babble in one of the best lines for Fred for the entire film. Listen, we found some beryllium on a nearby planet, and we might be able to get there if we reconfigure the solar matrix in parallel for endothermic propulsion. What do you think? Now, the beauty of that line is not just the fact that it's pretty clear that Fred has no idea what he's talking about, that the engineers simply told him what they need to do and he's repeating it back to them. But unlike much of the techno babble that we've seen in Trek, particularly later iterations of Trek, it actually makes sense. Reconfiguring the solar matrix, well, assuming that the ship has some kind of solar panels on it, that simply means that they're gonna do something with those solar panels, in order to achieve endothermic propulsion. Well, endothermic simply means a process by which heat is absorbed, which you could use the solar panels to do. And so if you're using that heat absorption to then somehow propel the ship forward, that actually makes sense, right? So it's not the craziest piece of techno babble ever, but the beauty of it is that we all know that these actors have no freaking clue. And just as when we watch on Star Trek, when we have characters ranging from Scotty, Geordi, Balana, etc., all of them basically saying these crazy techno babble lines, and they really don't have a clue as to what they're actually talking about. Well, <laughs> this is just gold. I love Fred in this movie because he's just kind of, eh, he accepts it, but he doesn't know, he knows he doesn't know what he's doing, but he's just going to let the engineers do their work. And when they get it right, well, he'll give them a hug. We'll do that. Right. That's right again. Let's come on, group hug. <laughs> and so with that, the Protector 2 heads to the unknown alien planet to retrieve some more beryllium so that they can get their ship back up and running and figure out a way to take on Ceres. Everybody on the ship has now accepted their role and we can begin to build these characters up now that we've torn them down. Yes, it is now that the characters are all heading on the right path. Though I am Thermian, I have lived my life by your philosophy, by the code of the Maktar. Oh, good. Very nice. By Grabthar's hammer, Dr. Lazarus. Don't do that. I'm not kidding. I'm sorry, sir. I was only just... Don't. Well, almost all of them. <laughs>